we're going to uh, look at commandments 8 and 7. And you have it in your bullet in front of you. They have the commandment. And then that little italicized, what does this mean? That's going to be my voice. I'm speaking on behalf of Martin Luther. And then you come in on the bold again, uh, and we talk about what it means. And we'll do that for both commandments. By the way, just as you should know this, I uh, am focusing on the Eighth Commandment. You know, you shall not lie. Um, because there's so much involved in that one. And last week, during the Tenth and Ninth Commandments on coveting, I dipped into stealing because coveting is the first step towards stealing, as you know. So, commandment number eight, let us read it together. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. What does this mean? We are to respect and love God so that we do not tell lies about our neighbors, betray or slander them, or destroy their reputations. But instead, we are to come to their defense, speak well of them, and interpret everything they do in the best possible light. Commandment number seven. You shall not steal. What does this mean? We are to respect and love God so that we neither take our neighbor's money or property nor acquire them by using shoddy merchandise or crooked deals, but instead help them to improve and protect their property and income. All right, I just got to get this up. There we go. Now, just a little quick primer, a Lutheran primer on the commandments, lest we fall prey to a very natural understanding of the commandments, which is not correct. You know, three, four, five minutes into any conversation uh, on the plane with people who see my collar and want to talk about religion, uh, sometimes I'll get involved in well, what is your faith and what is your faith and so on. And we have marvelous conversations. I love to talk with people. And, but five minutes into the conversation, if there's a question about, well, what is Christian faith? Do you know what the answer is nine times out of ten? Uh, the Christian faith? The Ten Commandments. And obeying them and going to heaven. That's the answer. By the way, not just for certain groups of Christians, but Lutherans too. A few years ago, there was a study, I think it was in 2015, where 38% of the Lutherans gave that answer. Uh, Christianity, obey the commandments so you can get God to like you and bring you to heaven. Now, I know a lot of people think that, but it's just not true. That's not the heart of Christianity. However, that's not to degrade the commandments. They're part of our faith. They're part of our faith understanding. They just don't get you brownie points to heaven. Nor do they get you to love God, who already loves you, your neighbor, your curmudgeonly uncle, and everybody else. Loves them all already. You can't get God to stop loving you. The commandments are a mirror for us to see what God would love us to live like. A life of harmony, or better yet, the Hebrew word shalom, which means a life where nobody has too much and nobody has too little. That's my little rendition of it. Um, that's what God wants for the whole world, every human being. Love your neighbor and love God. And here's what it looks like. Now, granted, the, the commandments are in a prohibitionary style. You shall not do this, you shall not do that, and so forth. And it's easy to turn them into a transaction because we live in a society where we love to get what we want by doing meritorious stuff. I do something for God, God must have to do something for me. This kind of thing, see? It's not a transaction with God. It's all gift. And the Hebrews gave us this set of instructions this picture of shalom, the way the world should live in righteousness and holiness and goodness and love. And uh, Martin Luther took that and he said, every commandment that has a, a shall not also needs a shell. And that's why he, and I don't think he was the 
first one, but he really featured it. Here's what you get to do as a Christian with Christ living in you, forgiving you for the shoddy way we treat the commandments, and we do. Luther said we break them all. And to be renewed in our faith to live differently. All right. Now, that's enough of my primer. You maybe have heard that from me before, but, and I love to repeat it. Okay. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Uh, anyone who says, oh, the commandments, they're not really relevant to our time. I have a few examples for us tonight, and uh, you'll know more of them. And as I bring them up, you'll think of some more. Number one, in 2009, you might remember this, our Lutheran Church, and I'm proud of us, we're far from perfect, we got our problems, our Lutheran Church took a 20-year-old study of sexuality and we made a historic decision. It wasn't just the bishops that voted for this. All across the country, we voted to ordain deacons and pastors who are LGBTQAI+. And I'm very happy for that. And, but more importantly, I'm glad that Lutherans who were born out of both a church and a university talked about these things and studied them. And, you know, we, we can make fun of the three years for every social statement that comes out, but you know what? We study them thoroughly. And I'm glad for what we did. However, and the bishops know this the best, it was not without some consternation. There were congregations that left our church. And we wave goodbye to them with uh, gratitude that they are finding another place. Uh, when they did that. That's fine. That's the slice of life. But there were half-truths and lies that were quite prevalent during this time. And by the way, Martin Luther said, and I love this, half-truths are worse than blatant lies. And you know why? Because a half-truth contains some truth. And if you're a powerful speaker and you jazz people up and you start with a half-truth, and you don't finish the whole truth, you get whole swaths of people who just listen to the first part and they don't hear the whole thing. This happened with the gay lesbian issue. All you needed to do was find one example of some person in that group that didn't seem like they should be ordained and that's all they spoke about and they had followers. Oh, yeah, they, they, maybe they shouldn't be ordained, see? But they left out the fact that that's one out of, you know, thousands who are qualified and ready to serve, see? That's what a half-truth does. And so there was consternation about that, and we got through it. And I'm proud of that. Um, then there were all kinds of lies given about that particular set of people and fundamentalist understandings of Leviticus and not telling the whole story about the Bible, which Lutherans are pretty good at, that it's contextual. What is the context of Leviticus? Why does it say what it says? You know, Lutherans at our best are thinking people. You know, sometimes we forget to think, but most of the time we do. Number two, our current presidential campaign. Oh, what does that say? You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And you know, Jesus defined the neighbor as who? Everybody. You don't like a particular candidate? Still your neighbor, my friends. And it was fraught with half-truths and degrading the character and the reputation and the good name of other senators and legislators and uh, candidates for presidents. You know this. I mean, it's so, uh, it's not even funny anymore. It is so snarky. It is so divisive. And all kinds of half-truths, you know this. If you're, if you're like me and tempted to get on the news channel every night, you should take a little hiatus every three days because it is so toxic with lies. And the problem with lies is they treat people as objects, as I said last week, and we've lost our humanity and we've lost our faith when we do that. We have to be renewed by Christ. Okay, uh, you know that. Number three, global warming. <laughs> okay. So here, here's what happens. People who are global denying people, I don't know how many people there can be left. <laughs> Minnesota right now has had heat waves. 
my wife, who's coming home tonight at 8.30, I'm going to pick her up at the airport. She's been in Minnesota, and I expected, you know, maybe 30 below or something like that in February. Oh, no, it was 58 degrees. There was no snow at the cabin. And all the old timers, we have never seen this like this, Becky. Never, never. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, but here's what happens with global warming. As an example of our nature to make up half-truths and present them as the whole truth. Okay, so someone will say, well, you don't believe in global warming, Pastor, do you? And they ask me this. I mean, because you know, scientists have shown us that oh, there have been billions of years where the earth has been in, invaded with great heat so that nothing could grow. And then it would come to an ice age, yes. And it would be so cold, nothing can grow. This is, this is nothing. This is what's going on right now. But what they leave out is the second half of that truth. The same scientists who told us about the ice ages, yeah, no one was there, but we figured it out by smart scientists, have told us also that within the very last drop of recorded human history, or any, any history, recorded or not, we have done by our demand to use more and more energy by our use of fossil fuels, this is all scientific, real scientists, not fake ones, <laughs> that we have ourselves contributed hugely with uh, greenhouse gases to create what we're now experiencing in a very short time, not the billions of years, see. But all you have to do is say the first part of truth, and it is true, there have been these cataclysmic uh, changes in weather. Or as George Carlin likes to say, who is a little earthy, maybe you didn't know that, <laughs> but he would say, oh yes, you know, the earth is, you think a tin can on the ground is going to bother the earth? He starts out like this, see? You think a little gum wrapper is going to bother the earth? A little bit of fossil fuels? And he goes on for about a half hour and says all this. You think that the earth can't handle that? Oh, the earth can handle it. It'll survive just, just fine. You won't. But the earth will. You know, this is the thing about half truths. see? It, it's sneaky. It catches you because there's just enough truth for you to take the first part and then go home and forget the second part. Or if they never use it, you never hear it. All right, global warming. What about this? Think about this. Um, think about the lies we told as a culture, as a country, about Native Americans and African Americans at the beginning of colonialism. Think about the hundreds of thousands of Native Americans that were slaughtered because they were, because the lie was, as you know, they're not really human beings. They're savages. They don't have language and customs. Yes, they did. Think of the thousands of kids. By the way, Minnesota has five reservations alone where I served. Think, and think of the boarding schools. We kidnap kids in grade school, through high school, and beat the heck out of them, made them lose their Indianness, so they become white supremacists just like us. Many were abused. By the way, the church, in some portions, was part of the boarding schools that tried to snuff out their identity. And uh, you look at the slave trade of the African Americans, same thing. Half-truths and outright lies destroy community. Always. And uh, sometimes they're, they're given as a sense of being funny, and they're not. And we should be the first to say they're not. Men, for centuries, have told half-truths about women. Uh, the weaker sex, you know, they're not thinking like we are. A lot of emotions, up and down. Can't rely on women. And we're still fighting that. Thank God there have been brave women and some men. Many men now are joining that. But think of the centuries where we kept women in their place by lying or telling half-truths. Commandments not relevant? Well, I think they might be. Um, the church has lied too. Um, we know, know we're, we're Lutherans, we know we're saint and sinner, but we must face this lie, too. We've said things that were not just half 
truths, but out and out lies about ourselves. Now I say church, I'm talking the whole body of Christ in all of its various mutations and so forth, all across this land, if you took them all together, here's what many of us have said in not so many words, but we were never racist. Hmm. We were never homophobic. This is me making all this noise, isn't it? We were never homophobic. Uh, we never ignored the leadership gifts of women and girls. Yes, we did. For years. For hundreds of years. Look how old the church is. Uh, we never acted as though our ethnic backgrounds were the same as our religion. Really? I know those Norwegians in Minnesota. Ludafisk was right on par with the sacrament of Holy Communion. It ain't the same thing. Now, and I'm being funny, but really, uh, without thinking very clearly, that message has kind of come across over the years. Okay, I'm going to hold this. Um, what was the next one? Oh, we never just celebrated our gifts and ignored everybody else's. You know, those Assembly of God people. They're loud. They raise their hands, you know, and so on. Um, it doesn't mean we can't be comfortable with the worship the way we like it, but there are gifts from other churches that we as Lutherans could learn and could understand the depth of Christianity and the breadth of Christianity. Okay, I, I'm just saying, Christian, it's one of the things my professor back in seminary said, honesty is the best policy even for Christians. <laughs> we, we have to be clean about this. And the commandments show us, they're a mirror to the fact that we don't live in God's shalom as we ought. All right, a little illustration of the do part. Let's read the do part together again. I'm going to get this out of my pocket. I think that's the problem. Okay, and I'm right. All right, number eight, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. What does this mean? We are to respect and love God so that we do not tell lies about our neighbors, betray or slander them, or destroy their reputations. But instead, we are to come to their defense, speak well of them, and interpret everything they do in the best possible light. How does it work? When I was in sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, I was a not outstanding baseball player in the Minnehaha Falls Athletic Club, South Minneapolis. But I loved our coach, Mr. Baines. He was marvelous. He kept us all, even myself, second base player. My, my arm wasn't that good. And I would put Aiken on second base, you know, this kind of thing. But I was in every game, see? And so was Kenny. And Kenny was not a good player. He knew it, and everybody knew it. Mr. Baines knew it, but he played Kenny because we were a team, see? Well, I remember all the bullying that went on toward Kenny, who, who already had some um, issues in life that he had to work through. And you know, kids can be cruel. And uh, I saw this bullying going on, but I was a little kid, and the bullies were big, and I was a scaredy cat. But I remember one time when Mr. Baines left the dugout, when we actually had dugouts. Minneapolis was fat and sassy and had money. And we had these fields with dugouts for the kids. The kids. We thought we were like big league players. I loved it. Uh, he left the dugout, Mr. Baines, and these two bullies they were always jerks. And they were over and they were really taking Kenny to task. Lying about him, making up stuff, smacking him around a little bit. And Neil Kingsbeck who was not particularly big, but was a great first baseman, and everybody loved him. He was watching this. He was in confirmation, too, my confirmation class. And he walked over there, and he said, stop it right now. Don't you ever do that to Kenny again. And those two bullies didn't know what to do. I mean, nobody said that to them, ever. But from that day forward, it was a turning point for Kenny. And I remember feeling, Tommy, you were such a chicken. This guy did what you should have done. This is the positive side of the commandments. Um, I love how it says, uh, 
come to their defense. That's what Neil did. Speak well of them and interpret everything they do in the best possible light. You don't have to force yourself to make up stuff, but you can give the best possible light. Everybody has the capacity for good and for evil. Find the good in someone and share that. You can be honest about that, see? All right. Now, uh, about the stealing. We should do that. Uh, number seven. Let's read that together. You shall not steal. What does this mean? We are to respect and love God so that we neither take our neighbor's money or property or acquire them by using shoddy merchandise or crooked deals, but instead help them to improve and protect their property and income. I just want to say one thing about this, and that is because I've covered stealing already in the covet. But there are many ways to steal. My dad was the first one to tell me that as a young kid. And you can steal someone's joy. You can steal someone's joy. We, all, we always think about, you know, like my wife, I can tell this, she's not here. You know, this marvelous person brought up in a really strong Baptist tradition. You know, the commandments were huge. You know, she, she, you never heard of this. Twin Bing chocolate candy bars. They were they're really good and they're really bad for you and really rich. And all the kids loved them back then. And she, who was brought up in this real law-oriented church, stuffed a Twin Bing bar in her pocket. And her mom was with her but didn't see it. And they drove home and mom heard the little crinkling of the paper. And did she catch heck? Drove right back to the dime store, as we called it back then. Walked her in, pulling her by the hair, bringing her to the clerk, and saying, this young lady has an apology to make. Becky remembers this. Well, that's what we think about stealing. But there are really more worse uh, kinds of stealing than objects. There's somebody's joy that can be stolen. Kenny's joy was what? Stolen by a couple of jerks. Um, you can steal the, the good name of your neighbor. You can steal energy from your neighbor. Uh, there's all kinds of ways to steal. And I, I think it might be just good for you to think about that between now and next week when you, we get to the next commandments. At any rate, um, yesterday's gone. Tomorrow has not yet come. Think not only about the commandments, but about the one who holds us tight, Christ himself. It's a promise. Trust the promise. Even when we do break the commandments, even when we discard them or don't think about them, um, Christ be in my mind, Christ be in my heart, 